bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, the Associate Director of CAFC, Canadian Association of the Advertiser. And today we're going to be talking about the information age and improve transform the Canadian health ecosystem. And it's my pleasure to invite our webinars to help uh, that who have presented with us before on this uh, very on, so on topics similar to this related to the pediatric rehabilitation reporting system, and they're going to be talking about using data and to inform quality improvement for children do that really along the lines of the theme, uh, sort of this uh, improv team the last uh, few uh, weeks uh, uh, on our webinars where we've had a number of data-related presentations. So we're sort of continuing on with that line. Uh, as today's uh, presentation is going to be talking about through data and using the, the example of PERS, the PDA reporting system, the, sort of as an example. And and uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our two speakers. We have with us today Dorothy Harvey, who is currently uh, the co-chair of the PERS Steering Committee and is a member of the CINSER, the Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehabilitation, uh, the CINSER Leadership Council. And Dorothy is a physiotherapist and the manager of rehabilitation services at the Niagara Room Center. And she uh, the Ontario Association of Children Rehabilitation Services, or OCRS, uh, OCRS table. Jim Dorothy is CM David, one of my colleagues here at CAFC. CM is the manager of decision support and the health information analyst at CAFC, where she leads very important decision support quality and operational performance activity. So my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dorothy Harvey. Over to you, Dorothy. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to be starting today with a, a bit of an overview of the PERS system. Just so for, for those of you who may be on the line that aren't familiar with it, I know many of you probably are, but just a, just a brief introduction to what the system's intended for, what the results are. And then we're going to have a majority of our time really talking about some really significant activities over the past year, including the development of our first national report and some real lessons learned about um, the complexity of developing a national data set and a national reporting system, and some of the lessons learned over the past year as we've actually moved the system now into actually reporting and where we see some of our future directions. Um, so for those who are familiar with us and those who aren't, the Pediatric Rehab Reporting System has had some very generous sponsorship. Um, interesting to be doing it at this time of year because certainly one of our key sponsors was La Famille Villadeau and any of you that came to CAFC and listened to both Alex and Frederick speaking will know what a great uh, connection this has been for us to have them as our sponsors. But we've also had some other sponsorship from the Group Perron, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, CIBC Children's Miracle Day, Power Corporation of Canada and Air Canada. And, and just to kind of reflect on the fact that this system, in terms of the development of it, you know, has taken a tremendous amount of resources, um, both um, paid resources, volunteer time, people working off the side of their desks, and we really wouldn't have been able to make it work without the sponsorship of some of the people that have been identified already. To give you a brief overview of why this system in the first place, um, 
You know, a number of years ago, members of the Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehabilitation identified the need to start to look at how we were doing nationally. How could we compare our organizations? How could we learn from each other? What were the ways that we could identify best practices? You know, learn to see what was happening in one province or another. And some of this certainly was motivated by the current state of pediatric rehab, where we have over 200,000 children in need of complex care and certainly a significant number of additional children who may require single services such as occupational therapy, physiotherapy or speech language pathology or other rehab services. We recognize and we've seen the trend that the number of children living with disabilities will rise. Certainly for anyone that's working within the autism spectrum disorder, we know what the incidence has been. Um, in terms of what we originally thought 10, 15 years ago and what we're now currently experiencing. We also know that both clinicians and families and clients, kids themselves, were looking for information. You know, what we certainly hear from families is, is a sense of, you know, what, how are things being done in a different area? Am I getting, you know, the best bang for my tax buck in our community? You know, what kinds of things are happening in other parts? In an age where we're globally connected and socially through, and certainly through social media, we know families connect. So the family from New Brunswick is certainly asking the family from Alberta what their experiences have been and comparing notes. So, you know, for us to be at the forefront to ensure that we have a good understanding pan nationally is very critical to this kind of initiative. The high cost on the healthcare system. Again, we've got kids that are surviving they may not have survived 20 years ago and trying to understand their trajectories and their needs so that we can project out future-wise as to what our needs will be for pediatric rehab is critical. The other part was that we knew that we have different data reporting systems within each of our sectors and each of our provinces and that there was not necessarily data that was always accurate, either reliable or consistent across our organizations. So with that in mind, we are, our vision was to create a high-quality national database with a purpose to create, inform, and operationalize the collection of meaningful data from rehabilitation centers across Canada. Our target population initially was to roll out to children with autism and cerebral palsy. And the, the rationale for that was those are readily identifiable um, we have strong diagnostic processes in place in our communities, um, and there also probably are our highest volume for pediatric rehab centers currently. So starting with, with children that have more defined trajectories, where there's some classification systems in place so that we can be comparing apples to apples in many cases was, was critical. In our evolution of PERS, we have a number of key stakeholders. So certainly the pediatric rehab community and our Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehabilitation, we have PERS participating sites. So we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of who's onboarded and who we're hoping to onboard in the near future. Kids, youth, and families have always been at the heart of why we're doing this and why we continue to strive to have a good national reporting system. We also have our infrastructure um, with PERS that we're in the process of actually reviewing in the next little while in terms of our steering committee and working groups. On top of that are two major players, and that is the Canadian Institute for Health Information, CAIHI, and CAFSI, the Canadian Association for Pediatric Health Centers, who are um, our strong business partners and certainly the sponsors of this project. So for those stakeholders, there are a number of areas that we're looking at from a reporting perspective. So as we look at what the intent was for the data collection and for the reporting system, we wanted to look at both system reporting dimensions. Sam, I'm gonna ask you to advance the slide, thanks. Um, to monitor performance, to demonstrate accountability, to align resources and funding, we were cognizant that we were looking at organizational reporting dimensions, so an ability at an organizational level to evaluate services and programs, to compare with peers, and to also allocate resources in a meaningful way. And then we were looking at the individual level, so being able to assess individuals' health status, 
help clinicians make those clinical decisions and evaluate care. So those three dimensions are critical dimensions to why we developed the system in the first place and where we're moving towards as we're looking at the additional dimensions. To give you some perspective, this is a relatively new project and um, we all have strong ambitions for where we want to be, but I think certainly this year it's been a great learning experience to understand the complexity of trying to do a national reporting system and looking at the um, trajectory of where we were and where we are now, um, it's also an opportunity to help inform other similar adventures as we start to move forward. This is a new initiative for CAFC in that there's a lot of community-based involvement where before pediatric health centers were certainly the primary focus of their reporting. And um, as we go through our journey and have our lessons learned, we can help inform, particularly as we start to look at other areas where CAFC has identified the need for more data, including children's mental health. So from a milestone to date perspective, we are still relatively young in our journey. Our official launch was actually 2015, so not even three years yet. We started looking at some of the technical meetings in October to December of 2015. We initiated our site implementations January of 2016. We started to look at data and data submissions April of 2017. So that's really a short time frame in the world of pediatric rehab when we think about some of the change management, you know, the infrastructures that had to happen in terms of looking at data systems and reporting systems, particularly as we look at small community-based organizations, and CM will certainly speak to that a little bit more in her section of the presentation. By April to March, we were actually were starting to onboard new sites while we were supporting some of our ongoing sites and look at their data submission phase. We set a hard target of our first data submission for August 31st of 2017, and actually in October of 2017, we released our year one report, and you will have an opportunity to see that report as we move further into the, into the discussion. This year is critical because we're looking both at evaluating where we've been, but also evaluating where we need to go, and we'll have more discussion about that at the end of the presentation. Just as a quick reminder for people who may or may not be aware, we currently have eight participating sites submitting data. Um, Kitimat Child Development Center in British Columbia, Glen Rose Rehab Center in Alberta, the Alberta Children's Hospital in Alberta, the Alvin Buckwald Child Development Program in Saskatchewan, the Rehabilitation Center for Children in Manitoba, Holland Bloorview Rehabilitation Hospital in Ontario, Isaac Walton Killam Health Center in Nova Scotia, and Eastern Health in Newfoundland. So currently we have a nice broad representation across the country. Certainly there are some areas that we would like to further develop, particularly our partners in Quebec, and we'll talk about that as we get toward the end. So I'm going to hand it over to CM right now to talk about data set collection and implementation. Thank you, Dorothy. There we go. And so in this part of the presentation, I'm just going to hone in a little bit more on what the PERS data set consists of, the collection methods identify. So we were able to do a little bit of research between the months of April 2017 as we really digged into implementation and we're able to deliver a few findings that will not only play a huge role within the current um, sites that are playing that are participating in the project, but future sites as well. So Dorothy touched on reevaluation. So we'll be able to touch on a few of those um, phases that we were we identified in our findings. So just an overview for those of you who may be new to the project and on the line, the PERS data set itself consists of 62 data elements that are bucketed into different categories. So you'll find um, a series of eight or 10 data elements that are that consist of client identifier data elements, administrative and health characteristic data elements, so things like main problem, visit disposition, um, classification of severity. As Dorothy mentioned earlier, our two um, uh, target populations are children with cerebral palsy and autism. So when I when I highlight classification of severity, I'm really speaking to classification of severity at, with respect to children with cerebral palsy and autism. 
And then the last bucket here is the function, activity, and participation um, piece. And really, those are two parent tools that we rolled out this year and will continue to roll out in the, in the months to come. Those parent tools are the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory. It's a computerized adaptive test that you can download on your iPad, as well as a Participation and Environment Measure Child and Youth, the PEMCY tool, which also it, you can um, access to either using a computer or a paper version. Now, this is going to be play a key role into our discussions as we move ahead and as we think about implementation and we think about the future um, approaches that we were able to identify this year. Key components of this year's work included some key players, and I know um, Dorothy just talked a little bit of some of those key stakeholders, but the key players that, involved, that were involved in the implementation of the project included a series of subject matter experts from across the country who really were able to participate in some of those important working groups as well as some of those is that evaluation components as we think about data definition, especially data definition in relation to a national project. Um, we had several clinicians involved and several clinicians involved that are involved in change management as well as data collection and submissions at their own center. Um, we have the Canadian Institute for Health Information in, in partnership with CASI's Canadian Pediatric Decision Support Network um, have partnered to ensure that the data quality pieces of data collection are also addressed and are continue to, um, we are continue to evolve in adapting our data quality measures as we uh, roll into submissions throughout the months to come and throughout the months that we did participate in data submission. Also a key component is that the back end of the data of the PER system itself is held within Kaihai's um, uh, a repository called the NACRS Clinic Light Repository, and that's where all the 62 data elements are actually submitted um, and collated. And so CPSN plays a big role in the technical components of that, as well as the analysis components of that, and you'll, we'll talk a little bit of, about that when we get into reporting. And then there's the family piece. And what I really wanted to highlight here is the voice of the family that's been embedded throughout the project um, throughout the several years before we went live in 2015 and as of today. And we and what's so fascinating is the role that family members have played in, in actually the design of um, their parent tools itself. So in the design phase of the PMCY, so that when a parent is actually using these particular tools, it's user friendly to their needs and to also their understanding. And so this was a huge um, component of the project as well that I wanted to highlight and really recognize those family members like Adrian Zaram, who played a key role in the implementation of these particular tools. So if we think about implementation and data quality, in the beginning of April 2017, we were really gearing into data submission. And finally, we're starting to see data elements come in uh, through our testing phase of data submission. But within that, we started to see a few um, barriers, a few, uh, a few, a few uh, pieces that needed to be addressed in the implementation. So we mapped out data elements that were collected and not collected at each facility. And so just to highlight, these facilities range in size and they also range in demographics and volume. So you'll have sites that are very large like Holland Bloor View and smaller sites that range from rural areas in BC to very urbanized areas here in Ontario. So that's a key piece to also recognize during a national rollout. The process map, um, we were able to collate a series of process maps from across the country and make those comparisons and themes to really get a better understanding it as if, if these um, certain data collection points were easier to collect at all sites, or were there more particular site-specific challenges? That was another component of the data submission process. And then the implementation of the PDCAT and the PMCY, which really consists of using new technologies and a change management component to the project as well. So now, when you take a look at these two different items, you could see that these could be maybe two phases or even three. So I'm now kind of alluding to the next phase of the of where. Um, we got where we, where we got towards our findings. So 
So what we found in, in conducting several of these interviews and calls, site-specific calls, um, was that there was a variability across the country. There was inconsistencies in the data collection methods that were found. There was a lack of clarity with specific data definitions. And so we found that there was a new user group um, that we moved into where, where we're really focusing on a technical phase and now into an actual data collection and found that we actually might not be speaking the same language with these new user groups, which consisted of clinicians and administrators, which were the new users involved in collecting our PERS data sets. So it was very important that we address the, these items. And then the third piece was around capacity. So do we have the right com, uh, capacity, either resources and tools in place to support all these different phases? So what we decided to do was, was create a survey, a national survey that we rolled out from across the country. And this particular survey uh, drilled down on the implementation approach that occurred at each facility. We were able to map out and identify data points, so the patient journey at each data point, and who was involved in collecting these particular data elements within those points. We were able to also understand if there are certain patterns, so national implementation patterns, that we were able to pull out of this survey, um, some themes and resources that we that could now be used in rolling out with a, um, across many other sites. And so you, what I'm gonna do in the next phase is actually deliver some of those findings where we were able to identify three implementation approaches from this survey. And so the first approach consisted of implementing using your existing electronic health information system at your organization. And so this was really for sites that already had kind of a decision support or an information system they were already um, working and that was already embedded within their organization. And what we were planning to do was leverage that system by building the front end component um, within that system. And the second one was for those sites that didn't have an electronic health information system that could, you know, had that functionality or cap capability to do that at the time. And so this option provided was provided by KaiHi and it's called the NACLAS Clinic Light Web Entry Tool. And we've also um, have um, implementation and uh, supportive documents and webinars to help support this piece and found that you know, a tremendous amount of sites gave us wonderful feedback about this approach being very user friendly, um, easy to use and kind of easy to navigate. And so it was wonderful to get that feedback. And these are for sites that really did not have that, um, those information systems in place. And then the third approach was for sites that didn't have both, but they still wanted to participate. They had a system that they could work with. Um, they could collect that the information. They already were collecting some of it. Um, and so they were manually sending their data to CAFC's Canadian Pediatric Decision Support Network. And so it was really important for CAFC, CPDSN, and both CAIHI to really understand that these three approaches are now, now exist. And what was important was to under, understand the capacity to, to support these three approaches. And so here you're going to actually, I've, I've gone ahead and identified which sites, um, which sites use an electronic system, which sites manually submitted data, and which sites use a web entry tool. And so if any of you are interested in really, you know, getting in touch with me or Dorothy to get a sense of, you know, the three different types of system and what would be, uh, be a good fit for your set organization, feel free to contact us. But you'll see here that out of the eight, four of them use their current electronic platform. Two of them send uh, data manually to CAFC CPDSN, and uh, two sites use the web entry tool. And so from the survey, as I mentioned earlier, we were able to identify that we needed to address the end user issues. So that um, when collecting this information, the information was standardized and and that the definitions were consistent. We needed to support the change management piece, and that's change management as it relates to your health information system and the two new parent tools. We also needed to support the data collection phases. So phasing out the 62 data elements into different phases was an important component to support. 
and then the implementation of the two brand new tools within each organization that involves now parents in collecting and submitting um, information. So the post-survey activities, and really just to highlight, this time frame consisted of about four months that we were able to um, meet the following goals and, and uh, make some transformational changes from across the country. So we established a data dictionary working group. We established a reporting framework working group, um, data quality measures, um, and we released an inaugural report at actually and was able to celebrate that at the CAFC conference this year. Um, we developed a reevaluation of the data collection approaches to address capacity issues. And so I'm going to be sharing that with you today and developed a staged approach, which is brand new um, for the roll up for the future of um, the pediatric rehab reporting system project. So what does the new data dictionary manual now look like and what does it now achieve? So as I said, the data dictionary working group was established over the summer, and there was a series of weekly meetings and in-person meetings that took place to identify the key data elements that needed further clarification in order to support the end user in data submission. And what I really wanted to focus here on was the end user has changed now, where before we had a technical user, and those were your IT guys usually, but now you have clinicians you know, collating this data, collecting this information, submitting it into the system. It was really important for us to understand, um, to help them understand what those data de definitions were, but also to provide case examples along with those data definitions. And so this manual really fit the need for that new user group. And we're, we're really excited to share with you the success of the manual. We've al already gotten some wonderful feedback on the new version and so we're quite excited that this was a huge milestone for us to achieve and share with our um, with our users and our organizations that are participating. And the next phase uh, consisted of the developing a reporting framework. So we know that we have 62 data elements. There was a wonderful group of a team from across the country that got together over the summer and established a uh, the dimensions of the reporting framework. And so it was important for us to understand, you know, what questions are we trying to answer? What part of the system is the PERS project itself trying to answer as it relates to um, these population groups? And so we were able to identify the following dimensions, and there were six uh, around access, quality, effectiveness, utilization, health equity, descriptive characteristics. And so of the six, three of them um, speak to the current report that we delivered in October, but the future reports will be able to speak to all these six dimensions. And so we're thrilled to actually um, move into that particular domain um, where I think that it will, there are several examples that around wait time that we're excited to kind of hone in on and make those um, and perform those analysis that uh, I know many of our content experts are eager to uh, dive into. The next piece over the summer, especially through the months of August and September, because this was the phase that we were finally able to get um, some data. And so here it was important for us to ensure that data quality measures took place and were in place. So we conducted direct case reviews, and that was conducted between Kai High, so they held the back end data, um, at, and, and we conducted these case reviews with each submitting site to ensure that these data elements actually uh, were submitted in the manner that they needed to be submitted. So for those of you who have are well aware of the PERS project who are on the line, um, and for those of you who are not, we have a technical specification documents for vendors, and so it was important to ensure that these specifications matched with the specifications that Kai Hai already also provides. And so this process took place over four weeks. And so I want to recognize the hard work that both Kai Hai, our Kai Hai folks, and our CPSN folks um, uh, provided, especially during this rigorous uh, and timely phase. And in the end of this, it was important to provide a report that demonstrated these quality measures. And so 
we plan to continue providing these reports to our site. And so here is a, a snippet of our inaugural report that we celebrated at um, CAFC's conference in October with the Bilodeau family. So it was a big milestone um, mm -hmm. where you'll see that there's 389 cases here that speak to age, language, gender, main diagnoses. So those three domains that I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, and so this was a big milestone to actually go through the um, changes that took place at each organization, get to a place of standardization, and then finally submission. So very happy and excited to share this with everybody. And so finally, before I close in on the data uh, collection piece and implementation piece, what was, it was important for us to look into as we you know, look into the future as we think about 2018. Um, in the evaluation phase of the project, we really identify that for future sites, we're going to we're going to implement starting with a staged approach. So really, that's either one dimension or two dimensions of the reporting framework, and that could be about you know eight, ten data elements just to start with the site. That being a first phase, and then phasing out into the rest of the data elements. And that's really to address and support capacity at the site level, to address any data quality issues in the early phase of the project. From our findings and our learnings in the last year, um, we think this approach will work really well, especially if we're thinking about a national uh, project of, of this type. So I'm gonna turn, now, turn it now over to Dorothy to uh, touch on future and keys to success. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm going to actually go back to talk a little bit more about the revised approach because I think this was really a significant um, think tank we had to be able to really look at the fact that, you know, if we look at the inaugural report, um, some people may look at it and say, well, look at, you know, how limited the number are. And certainly as we go back and review what we did over the past year in terms of looking at the capacity, we recognized that this represented a significant amount of work and it also represented a significant change management process. So while the numbers seemed somewhat small, we were even able to see that we were getting some, some interesting findings from some of the data. But that really led us, as well as the survey, to thinking about um, you know, maybe we were overly ambitious at the very beginning in thinking about the number of data elements and thinking about the reporting framework that we wanted to develop. We wanted to do it all and we wanted to get it all. And that may actually be because in, in addition to doing a survey of the sites that we're implementing, we also reached out to some of our partner organizations that were maybe thinking about implementing and some that were kind of on the cusp of doing so to sort of look at what the barriers were. What were the um, components that they felt um, were going to make it successful for them to implement? What were the things that they needed from us in terms of the PERS groups and CAFC and CPDSN to help them moving forward with that? So that led to a full day discussion. Um, and we actually also invited to that discussion both um, we had our members of our Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehabilitation and our PERS um, members, and we also brought Child Bright and our, um, our Kids Brain Health to that table because they were doing some parallel work at the time that was looking at specific dimensions of what was meaningful data reporting or what was meaningful information that a number of stakeholders were looking, and there were some really lovely parallels with some of their findings um, and some of the prioritization around some of their findings in terms of what components people were looking for and where we were sort of starting to think about going. And it kind of was, a, I would say, it was almost an aha moment where we said, you know, maybe, um, you know, trying to do all 62 elements is, is really not the approach to use. Maybe we need to hone in on what are those critical pieces of information that people want to hear about and then start to think about whether or not we could increase our sample size by just honing in on specific dimensions. And certainly, um, as CM has alluded to, weight seems to be um, a 
a sort of critical area that everyone is addressing or, or everyone is talking about across the country, maybe that's one of those first data elements. And when we actually layered it back to thinking about the data definition element, that was one of our big ones we had discussion about. Um, I certainly remember having that discussion in Ontario about how do we really define weight but we added the dimension of patient experience to that as well, and I think that helped us start to think a little bit more about how could we maybe start to onboard specific components and where were we struggling the most. And I think from uh, anyone that's involved in clinical practice always knows how difficult it is to change clinical practice, and the implementation of the outcome tools was something that was probably more challenging, even though it is parent done, it still has certainly a large component of clinical um, influence on that. And so maybe we needed to think about a more of a pilot project that would help us look at what were those um, factors that were making it more challenging for the collection of those outcome tools and how could we better support clinicians at the front end and families to identify ways of being able to implement it and embed it into clinical practice. So just to give some perspective on kind of why this phased approach, um, I think we're looking at what we knew we could collect well, what was already being collected, what was often consistent with what you were already collecting for ministry reporting, and then thinking about kind of the challenges um, that there were in looking at some of the tools. And we're not unique in this. Um, as we've looked across both Penn nationally, but also into the states and into, um, into international, you know, reporting on pediatric rehab and outcome tools for pediatric rehab are challenging everywhere. So we actually feel we're on the leading edge of it. And if we can develop systems and processes for supporting clinicians in that, then um, we're probably going to be in a better position to move forward. But maybe, again, looking at those organizations that really already have been either using the tool, tools or have already embedded some of that change management so that we can have lessons learned from that as we particularly look at some of our more community-based organizations. So within the future and keys to success, you know, I want to just take you back to what this was all about. It was really that dream of having connected networks across Canada with a common language of data, sharing stories of impact, because all of this data has people and clients and clinicians behind it. It's improving that, you know, again, back to those system pieces. How can we improve access, models of service delivery, leveraging data for resource allocation, and that concept of benchmarking performance? Because certainly as you look at the initial report, we have not yet moved to benchmarking. That's certainly something as we look at the reporting framework, we know we need to move towards. But first, we need to see what we can collect, what does it look like, and then are there opportunities to actually develop some benchmarks within that? And then that whole system of transitions and continuum of care because, you know, the great opportunity with Kai High obviously is that we have kids that move into the adult system. We know that that is a significant barrier for, number of our, for many of our families and our clients. And so how can we look at that continuum of data over the long term that may support as kids move into the adult system lessons learned from what the, what's happened in the pediatric system? I am going to show you a slide now that really speaks to where we can go. This is a mapping exercise that was done by Sonia Pagura um, of Holland Bloorview, who's my um, respected co-chair on the first steering committee. These are the organizations within Canada that actually are pediatric rehab or that have a pediatric rehab component to them. Wouldn't it be exciting if we could bring all of these people on board and start to collect data? And we think by having a staged approach that we can actually increase the volume of organizations that we will be implementing over the next phased time period, and that will be part of our evaluation, is what is our internal capacity to onboard new facilities in order to start to really make this data more robust and to provide us with some of those really exciting opportunities to dive into the data a little bit more deeply. As in order to do that, we both need to look at our opportunities to work with the broader pediatric rehab community and increase in awareness and engagement of PERS. So today is really about if you don't know about us, here's who we are, here's what we're working towards. If you do and you've thought about joining us, you know, here's where we're going and maybe we can bring you on board at this point in time. 
it's really that ability as well to provide mentorship for new participating sites through an efficient onboarding process. And, you know, the, the sites that are already um, implementing and submitting data are very interested in, in sharing their lessons learned and providing some one-to-one -one mentorship with like-minded organizations that would be able to. So we're looking at a system as we move forward where not only would it be the responsibility of the CPDSN and CAFC, but where onboarded sites already will provide that peer mentoring on lessons learned for like organizations within the communities of practice. It is to expand in that reporting framework to assure that we're in alignment with our original project objectives. And it's also to begin to explore the inclusion of other functional and diagnostic profiles. You know, in looking in hindsight, you know, we did pick ASD and NCP, but actually many of those organizations that are currently onboarding or onboarded serve a much wider population. And our challenges that we thought we might face from the diagnostic perspective, I think, are less than what we actually anticipated. And that, you know, the, the next phase may be to just let's onboard or let's have sites implementing all, all populations, because as we look at certain elements, it would be useful to know not just, you know, those kids with ASD and CP in isolation, but all the kids that are accessing pediatric rehab, what are the impacts of weight and certain components on that. So it's a discussion we're still going to be having, um, and we'll be certainly looking at some of our, our sites that are already implementing to get feedback on, on what that might look like. For most of us, we're collecting data regardless already, um, and so how can we potentially look at some of those key elements where diagnostic capacity or diagnostic components or, you know, characteristics of the child may not yet, yet be that important um, because we want to be able to look at maybe things like access or utilization. So those are elements that we're talking about. Um, it's, again, to start to implement and collect the additional data elements we may find as we're moving, particularly as we're looking at new populations of children, that the um, and as we're looking at a reporting framework, that there may be things that we missed in the 62 data elements that we started with that we may want to think about including, um, and particularly as we start to move into more community-based supports and community-based organizations, are there additional things that would be meaningful for those? The other key component of the work this year will be an evaluation framework, and that's not just evaluating what we've done, but also thinking as we're moving forward, how will we know that this system is really making a difference, and how, what are the success factors that each of the stakeholders would include? We did a bit of work on this already in October, but we now need to expand that work to start to look at future direction and understanding again from each of the stakeholders that are involved what is value added for them when we are looking at a data system like this and what are the things that maybe aren't so value added so that we can actually look at how do we make change and improve the system as we're moving forward. So what will it take to make this all successful? Um, as with any initiative, um, effective leadership, organizational strategy, and so that's a little bit of what we're going to be working towards at the PERS steering committee level together with CAFC and CPDSN, and CHI-HI is kind of what is that organizational strategy we need to move forward. You know, we continue to partner with families and we want to broaden the depth of families who are providing input into the system and into some of our implementation. Um, what do we need from the way of education, information, and resources for both our organizations that are currently implementing and those that are coming on board? And it is that, uh, that opportunity to have that continuous improvement and change management mindset. You know, we certainly experienced um, some of the challenges around change management. How do we embed change management and provide tools and resources for sites that want to implement as well as for, you know, when we do get findings where we may say, gee, you know, this doesn't seem to be working. Um, here's a better way of doing things. How do we embed that change management into, you know, respecting where clinicians are at or where organizations are at, but giving them the um, strategies or some impetus potentially for moving in a new direction or for embracing a new model of service delivery. And then assessment and evaluation. So at the organizational level, all of these will be critical and certainly at the PERS level, all of these will be critical for moving forward. 
So as we look at growth and partnerships and we look at how we start to bring more of our facilities on board, um, we talked already about that peer-to-peer -peer implementation approach for new members. We've talked about the support that Kai High and CAFC CPDSN has been providing from a technical component, and then that working together to provide national reports. So for those of you who are new to this process and, you know, I've sparked some interest in m and I, um, certainly if you want to find out more about um, becoming a partner, becoming a PERS member, becoming a PERS um, Implementer, um, CM would be our best contact at this point in time. I'm going to end the presentation there and it open up for questions. Thank you very much. I do apologize. My audio quality isn't great this week, but uh, I will do my best and hopefully uh, uh, and CM will struggle through and, and hear any questions that I have and, uh, with the audience. So do type your question in the question box uh, and we'll bring them forward. The one question that came in was, uh, given that this type of requires a fairly high level of commitment from an organization that you know, various senior leaders have, would have to participate, what would you recommend some of the key Things to get in line when presenting this to, to your organizations, and supporting people who are interested. Do you want me to start, Sam, and then you can jump in? Sure. Sure. Sounds good. Um, I think that, you know, again, if we're looking at it from a perspective, most of our pediatric rehab facilities are either accredited or they're really looking at the fact that we are living in an environment of resources that are not necessarily growing to the needs that we have. So this system will enable us to certainly um, be able to, so I think that, you know, when we look at change management, it's first the compelling vision. What is it that we want to do? You know, is it the kinds of information that are going to help us move organizations forward? So that's the first, at the highest level, um, kinds of discussions that we often have with, with new facilities or with facilities that are considering on moving on or, or really think, you know, what's the value added again from my perspective? I think by moving towards a more staged approach, because I think when we first started to identify, you know, here were the data elements, um, you got a little bit of that, you know, you could feel the gut sometimes go, oh my goodness, how am I going to collect all this? But by starting to look at a more staged approach where we would look at collecting information that may already be collected within your facility um, and then also thinking about the fact that this doesn't have to require you to have expensive infrastructure. As CM highlighted, there are different ways to be able to collect the data. In many cases, you are already using those ways to be able to either report to your boards or to your funders or other stakeholders. So can we leverage what you're already currently reporting on and look at a way of being able to collect that more pan-nationally so that we can start to look at some comparators um, across the, the, pro the, the nation? Sam, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, I think you touched on the biggest point of it. You know, one of the uh, hugest transformations, I think, since the last three years of uh, kind of moving things along here is is that staged approach that you identified, Dorothy, you know, to be able to support the site at the capacity, at their current capacity and future capacity is number one, when we're thinking about what it takes to start. And number two, I think it's both the value add from the site's perspective on the site level where you can still have access to local level reporting in a, with, uh, and it, it's, with all the data quality measures in place that not only speak to your own site, but also to, you know, provides that national picture, which so many of the organizations I think have identified as a huge gap and a value that would be tremendously um, valuable for organizations and for, for various administer level, administrator level, system level, individual level planners. I would add the other piece that we've discussed in looking at a phased approach is also a different business model for how we're moving forward with this project. So, um, you know, where people 
previously may have identified that you know cost to onboard would be a bit of a, a barrier. If we look at a different business model where basically you're you know contributing based on the data elements that you are submitting, that may also be more um, you know more more of a easy win with senior leadership, particularly smaller organizations. Mm -hmm. For those organizations that are already submitting to um, to CAFC for different components, I think, you know, and we see that if we look at kind of who's already onboarded, they are they tend to be some of the larger organizations that are already members. But for smaller community-based organizations, you know, it may if it seems a bit onerous in terms of thinking about how, you know, how your membership needs to be uh, supported or or that that so it seems to be a bit of a barrier. That's one of the things that we've also been discussing with CAFC in terms of looking as we move this forward. All right. Uh, the question is asking uh, or is saying you identify a number of ways in which this uh, information would be used to improve care through quality improvement or improving patient experience. Can you give a little more of a practical example of how you being used? For example, just a, a mini case study, if you could just use your imagination to see how functional data like this might be used to improve uh, in a quality improvement approach? Well, I think when we look at kind of, again, the ability to collect data from a number of different dimensions. So if we go back to the reporting framework, as we were looking at that, that very much had that quality improvement approach to it. So let's take a client with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy being seen in British Columbia. And we compare that to a client being seen in Ontario. Um, first of all, we'll be able to look at access and determine kind of from a weight perspective what are relative um, wait times, but also thinking about it from a utilization point of view and an outcome point of view. By having each of those data elements, we can start to look at that holistic view of um, what our services are providing, and what the outcomes of those services are. And when we look at the utilization elements that we're collecting, they're collected actually at the parent level, which is another component of this, because for many of the sites that are onboarded now, they may be involved with doing assessment of the child, but they may not necessarily be providing the ongoing treatment. So we've asked parents to give us information about intensity of service, you know, are they looking at um, you know, alternative services, how much are they accessing private services. So again, as we're thinking about resource allocation in the future at the higher level, those are important things to consider as we're thinking about our own capacity. But if we can also look at, you know, you know, here's something that's happening in, in, in Ontario and we're seeing that, you know, this is you know, outcomes that people are experiencing based on a particular type of service delivery model, that may be something that I would want to know at my organization. Um, and whether it's in other Ontario, whether it's in BC, you know, that may be something that would help me think about from a quality improvement point of view, what can I embed either to be more efficient with my services or to be more effective with my services. I don't know if that answers it for the for the questioner, but that would be kind of what I would look at more at that functional level. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. I think that uh, just a follow up, please. Uh, if you do have a question, please type in, and we'll uh, look at it. I think we'll answer the question. Um, so, if there are any last minute questions, please do type them. And that is all we have uh, in the list for now. But if there is a, a follow up or anything else uh, related to that last answer that Dorothy did. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes, but while we're waiting for that, for any last-minute questions, uh, maybe we'll just uh, prepare to wrap it up, uh, and and maybe we'll just ask you a few any sort of key messages, any any next steps you'd like to share with uh, the audience that you haven't already shared, or or just any any key messages you'd like to close off. Yeah, I'll let you start. Sure, I think uh, you know. I think if there's any key messages. Um, what I'm really excited about for the next phase of the PERS project is um, not only just widening the data submission, you know, with wide, with wide. So I'm I'm talking more about the collection of smaller data sets as we increase the number of participation uh, participating sites, but also the length. So 
Um, I've already touched base with a few family members and a few sites that are starting to use the parent tools. And just to hear the feedback and the family voice in the last few weeks um, as it relates to the project itself is very new to decision support. Um, for some of you who may be sitting as an analyst on the call or maybe from the kind of um, analytical lens, um, you're well aware that patient portals are a new era to decision support and including the patient and family voice is, is new to data and information. And so what I'm thrilled to be, um, to be part of is including that family voice as we think about information, as we think about impact, as we think about outcome measures, and definitely as we think about analysis. So super excited for, for next year and, and the years to come. I would echo that certainly from CM's perspective. Um, as we've looked at implementing the outcome tools here, we've had our families involved and what a number of our families have indicated is these are tools that give them some perspective and help them with their goal setting. I mean, how many of us don't hear, well, I'm not really sure what my goals should be or where should these are tools that the families are coming back and saying, aha, now I get it. And now I get how I can help prioritize or how, you know, what are, what are going to be the critical things from my family. So that's been a bit of a side. I don't know that that was our intended, but it certainly has been. And, and we have to both um, compliment the, the tool designers who really looked at this from a family engagement perspective and looked at it from that, you know, again, the big picture on, on all of this is the ICFCY, and it's really certainly helped as we think about where we're moving as a sector from a pediatric rehab. And sometimes we're dragging people along with us who, you know, don't necessarily always. Clinicians can sometimes, you know, I'm a clinician myself, so they can sometimes be set in their ways. So that change management and that ability to help them identify how this is actually engaging families more, I think has been a really good lesson learned in this process. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's a great spot to end it. I think it was, it was a great, uh, a great response. I think uh, it was a great vision, of the future, the engagement piece, and you know, I think that's really, uh, that's really, really something to look forward to. So, thank you very much, both of you, for uh, a great presentation. A whole year of this work, uh, back many years with the national minimum data set that we started with. We're now uh, with the help of Alex Billado and in 2010. So, uh, thanks again for your presentation, and uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, as most of you know, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and when you do uh, watch live, you can just ask your questions and post your comments. If you can't, we do, uh, can't watch live. We do record these sessions, and available after the fact on the network. Uh, next webinar on February. Uh, we'll, we will ask, what have we tried and what works? And we're going to talk about an environmental scan of organizational supports for evidence in action in the matrix. Uh, and we're going to be hearing from Stephanie Knight from Sunnyvale Center in Vancouver, BC, uh, who has been doing research in the area of non translation for many years. And she's going to share with us an overview of what we've tried in the movie, uh, what evidence tells us about how to translate knowledge into practice. And following that, on February 21st, we're going to hear from our colleagues from McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario, where we will talk about PICU Liberate, the ABC recovery. Uh, in this session, they're going to talk about the journey that McMaster Children's Hospital's PICU has taken to implement an eight-part pediatric care bundle to help liberate, in quotes, children from experiencing common, often preventable PICU-acquired morbidities, such as delirium with all nutrition, uh, which can often contribute to lingering effects and symptoms well beyond PSU term. So uh, a couple of great uh, topics coming up in the next couple of weeks, and hopefully we'll see you back next time.